it's very nice to be here and speak to you, Sir Patrick. I have not told you, it's just Patrick. Never ever call me Sir Patrick. Okay, <laughs> all right. Patrick it is. I wanted to ask you what first drew you to astronomy, because that's what you're most I know the for. exact moment. Um, my mother was always vaguely interested and has some books on it. I picked up a small book belonging to her called The Story of the Solar System, and there it is. And it's there on your it's shelf. Book. And uh, I was just seven and a half years old, and it was not a boy's book, but my reading was all right. And I read this through and thought, this is interesting. I'll follow this up. And how did you follow it up? First of all, I did a bit more reading and got the basic things. I then went out at night and learned my way around the sky, which doesn't take long, you know. I then borrowed a pair of binoculars and used those, and then thought, well, this really is interesting. I was thinking of getting a telescope, and I've got one, it's in the holder. And I went on my way, as simple as that. And I had some, several bits of luck. For one thing, I lived then at East Grinstead in Sussex. And opposite us was a big estate run by a man named Henry of Allen and Henry's. In his garden, he had a small observatory, Brockhurst Observatory, with a six inch refractor. And the astronomer was W.S. Franks. Franks took me on and showed me how to do work the thing and allowed me to go there with him when I was a boy. So I got used to it. Then Frank suddenly died, which was very sad. And Henry shot, gave me the shock of my life, saying, Look, you are 13, uh, my astronomer's dead, will you run my observatory for me? So suddenly I found myself running a small observatory, which wow. I did, and right to the wall. Wow, that's fantastic. Great fun. Yeah. Brockhurst Observatory. You said that you found it interesting, and you're not the first person to have obviously been captivated by stars and things. So why, why do you think humans are so fascinated by stars and space and looking into the night sky? It's all around us, and things we don't understand, things we want to understand. It's there looking at us, you can't mistake it. And uh, when you start inquiring, you want to go on. At least I did. <laughs> and actually I had more time than most boys, because I'm... Between 5 and 15, I was laid low by a cock heart. So things I couldn't do then, I've done since. What do you think we can learn from stargazing? Astronomy is really the basis of all timekeeping and navigation to start with. And you can't separate astronomy from any other branch of science. Some people have tried to do that, but frankly, you can't. It's over there. You always come back to it in the end. Yes, that's true. And uh, I hear that pulsars are the most accurate way of keeping time. Yes, the most accurate clocks we know so far. <laughs> you spent most of your life stargazing, but would you say that our exploration of space, uh, the people we're sending up into space, has stalled since we landed on the moon? Do you think we're doing enough? People think uh, things are slowed down. In a way they have, in a way they haven't. So far as manned research are concerned, yes, they have most certainly, but unmanned research, no. And think what's been happening at various space telescopes. As a first set, you'll know. I mean, the spits are stones mm -hmm. of that nature. And they're sending this information back all the time. I've been spent 10 years writing my big data book on astronomy, which Cambridge are publishing, which should come in February. And of course, I've had to update it. And uh, I now had to update the updates. So you feel like the, the technology that we're using from Earth to look at space has really progressed? No, no doubt about it, it has. Mm -hmm. And there really is collaboration there, between us and the Russians anyway. Mm. And the Chinese, I hope, will, call for, will come in. No, our progress there has been very, very good indeed. We're learning more all the time. Do you think the human species has a future in space? I know one thing. In 50 years' time, the world won't be the same place as it is now. It'll either be far better or far worse. It won't be the same. You'll see it, I won't. Which do you think? it'll be? I'm hoping it'll be for the better. Are you an optimist? Uh, I'm a realist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you think we might colonise Mars if we want to? So far as Mars is concerned, the trouble about getting there, in my view, and you'll probably agree with me here, is quite simply radiation. Yeah. Technically, we could do it now, but radiation we can't. We're going to spend weeks in space I'm protected. And so far, we've no way how to solve the radiation problem. Mm. And until we do that, 
and we won't get to Mars. Mm. And there's no magnetic field on Mars, of course, to protect once well, you're there. Well, there's a tiny one, not, not enough. Yeah. The radiation problem, to my mind, is the thing that will hold us up for a long, long time. Once we solve that, then, and then again, going beyond Mars, where next? Well, you have so far to go. And the one thing I am certain, we talk about planets of other stars. Well, Kepler's just found an Earth-like planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they are light years away. We are never going to get there by the means we know today. Mm -hmm. Rockets won't do it. Nothing will. And there's got to be some fundamental breakthrough mm -hmm. about which we can't even discuss now if we haven't any ideas. Mm -hmm. Space warps, pipe warps, teleportation, mm -hmm. thought travel. Yes. That's all pure science fiction. Yes. But television would have been science fiction a few, a couple of hundred years ago. Yes, of course. Of course. There's got to be some fundamental breakthrough. And until we've managed that, we are not going to get to the stars. But it could happen. Yes, okay. And if we survive and go on as we are and really work together and uh, make, build a true civilization, then eventually we'll do it. Okay, well. Say, the moment, that sounds like optimism to me. At the moment, we are rather less civilised than the Athens of Pericles. <laughs> we have the means to destroy ourselves and have the civilization not to do it. Mm. Okay. So you think, that, you know, if, if we had a paradigm-changing breakthrough in physics, we could eventually live outside of the solar system? There's got to be some breakthrough about which we can't even discuss on them. So we have, we have no idea what it may be, but yes. it's got to come. If yeah. it doesn't come, we're stuck here. With all this fascination with the solar system, are we doing enough to look after our own planet until we do have the opportunity to leave, do you think? No, we're not. There are various problems that are facing us here. The worst being overpopulation. Yeah. We are using up our resources, which you can't renew. Mm -hmm. And there's got to be some change there. Mm -hmm. Can astronomy teach us anything about ourselves? You know, Is there any lessons that mankind can learn you know about us as a species from looking at the stars we are learning about ourselves and what life is like and bear in mind also as yet we've no positive proof of life anywhere outside the earth mm -hmm. i'm sure it's there look up our galaxy a hundred thousand million stars in our galaxy there must be other beings up there but are they like ourselves well all life we know is carbon-based. You know, that's what I do. Well, if there are silicon-based life, if it exists, it would be totally different from ours. But I rather suspect that it doesn't. And my own personal view is that probably life, whether it be, is going to build on the same elements as we are. If there are beings up there, and they're built like us, and they've got our kind of civilization, then we could communicate. And of course, we could one message from space from another race would alter our whole concept of everything, alter everything. Do you think it would unite us? I hope it would. If they could come here, they'd be more advanced than we are. And on Earth, we have the unfortunate experience that every time a more advanced technology has communicated with a lesser advanced, it's the lesser that it disappears. Yes. So um, some other scientists have suggested that we should be wary of answering any messages from uh, extraterrestrial life um, because, they, because of that very reason, because they might be hostile. If they can come here, they'll know more than we do, and they will have gone beyond the stage of war. Finally, what are your dreams for the future of mankind in general? What do you hope to see change in the world? A united world, a peaceful world, working together. That sounds idyllic. It is. It may not happen. I would like to think that it will. But say, I won't see it. You'll see more than I do, but even you won't really see it. Your children and grandchildren may. Mm -hmm. 